Hello and welcome to Family Time once again, your favourite programme on the family. We look at family issues, we look at the roles of wives, the roles of husbands, the position of the children in the family, how to ensure that we build a godly foundation as the Bible requires us to do. With me as usual is Pastor Kinsley PJ, Head Pastor Trinity Baptist Church, West Norwood, London, and his lovely wife, Pastor Mrs. Cynthia Apiji. Um, they have been married for 30 years, so anything that you listen to from this family is not from, a, from this program, it's not from a textbook, it's from real life experience. They've been there, they've done it, they've lived it. So that is why they're here to share their wisdom with us. So you're both very welcome uh, once again. Um, the last time we were looking at um, areas for flashpoints in the family, potential conflict areas with our teenagers. We've gone through a number of areas, uh, TV, communication, uh, the fact that they don't talk to us, all sorts. And then we touched on sibling rivalry. But then we decided that of its own, it was such a huge topic that we were going to set aside some time to look at it. So today, uh, for those of you joining us uh, for the first time, we're continuing uh, potential flashpoint areas and we're looking at sibling rivalry. So I'll start with uh, Pastor C, uh, as I always say, the mummy of the home. Uh, and all the quarrels and everything, always for some strange reason, seems to end in mummy's bedroom. So Pastor C, what do we mean by sibling rivalry? I think sibling rivalry is just unfortunate. Any time you hear sibling, it almost most certainly the next word that follows it is rivalry. So it's become a, a thing. Um, but sibling rivalry is when there are you know, quarrels between um, um, siblings, sometimes even jealousies between siblings, um, uh, fighting between siblings for all sorts of reasons. Um, so, you know, uh, every family will tell you that if, as long as you have w more than one uh, child, you are bound to, to find that happens. It doesn't happen when the age gap is quite, quite big. As I've, my own experience in the family, you find that those that are, are close in age may, may tend to have that kind of thing. So, for example, the, the, the oldest one will treat the very youngest one like her, their, their, their daughter and there isn't any kind of <laughs> rivalry or fighting or quarrelling between them. But those that are close in age together sometimes you can find that that happen uh, a lot. And Pastor C, why do they do that? Is it because they're jealous of each other? Are they competing? What actually causes um, you know, the rivalry between the children? I think there are several causes to, to, to sibling rivalry and I think the first one that I want to flag up is one that we parents um, cause ourselves and that is when we show favoritism um, and, and it, you know we have a graphic example in, in scripture where Joseph's parents gave him a coat of many colours, I mean 12 children, you single one out and give them the best coat there is bound to be. And so Joseph's life ended well, but you know, <laughs> he went through trouble mm -hmm. just because of the fact that the brothers were jealous of him from the very start of his life. So I think sometimes it's, it's where if children feel that we are impartial in the way we give them attention, that we like one more than the other, then that could cause, and so they want to, your attention, so they'll fight to get your attention. Uh, and sometimes the reason why that also happens with parents is that um, they find it easier to deal with compliant children, mm. find it more difficult to do, deal with strong-willed yeah. children. <laughs> That's right. Strong-willed children mm. are uh, a challenge. And so they feel that, you know what, you're too strong with that, can't handle you. <coughs> and so the one that is you know, a compliant child, it's easy to deal with. You tell them sleep, they sleep. Tell them whatever you tell them to do, they do it without question. So you, you seem to, you know, give those ones attention. And I think sometimes, I think um, sibling rivalry, um, the causes of sibling rivalry, I also believe that sometimes I have, I know people who, are, who have many boys and they'll say to you, sometimes when you know, holidays are coming up, they're, they're thinking, I'm dreading this time, this long vacation. All I'm going to have is fights and fights and every fights day. every day among these boys. I, I just think that sometimes as well, um, when they're bored, when kids are bored, they fight unnecessarily. 
So if you've got boys, get them out on the park. Let them run wild <laughs> um, at the park during the holidays. I also think that sometimes if we, as a family, uh, do not have quality um, family time together, it can be, it's not a direct, um, a direct uh, cause, but I think if you have good quality family time or um, you have times together with your, with your family, I, I always see this happen that any time we've had times with the family where we've gone out and had you know, a meal somewhere, we've had time to chat as a family, you come back, everybody is in high spirits. You know, the whole dynamics of the unit in the family change. And so that for a week or two weeks, everybody's happy, everybody's content. And so I think these are some of the causes of uh, sibling rivalry. But we need to be careful of the one that we create ourselves. Parents, quality time, not having quality time together as a family, um, okay. boredom, these <coughs> causes sibling rivalry. That's okay. Yes, J just to add to that, Juliet. Um, in terms of how parents contribute to uh, uh, siblings' rivalry, uh, our Josephs are always right. Mm -hmm. So any report they bring uh, regarding their siblings, yes, they did it. And uh, he's never wrong. Uh, so we are receiving all these kinds of reports about the other brothers and he's become the spy among them. <laughs> so naturally, we as parents, uh, we uh, unconsciously create um, a rivalry amongst them and uh, at times they can, they can take it on him, you know. And so it, it's, it's one of the uh, major areas that as parents we have to be very careful about because it has consequences. So as we shouldn't encourage like a blame game no. uh, to happen in the house? We, we should not only treat each other equally, but um, we should not accept one's report without properly investigating what they are saying. And at times, before they open their mouth, they've received a slap because Joseph came and said he did it. And because Joseph said it, and we've made him a coat of many colors. Mom and dad's favorite child. Anything he or she says is what goes. So, and if you, do, and, and the truth is that uh, they also, uh, those favorite children at times can be clever. And if any of their siblings is not in their good books, they will make sure <laughs> they get it. And they, have, and they always have a very clear, children are not stupid, you know. Mm -hmm. So as parents, we must uh, investigate whatever report, call them, talk to them wisely, yeah. I perceive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, um, adding to what Pastor just said, um, sometimes what we also do as parents is that, you know, you, you know that a particular child is, is always the, <laughs> the one that is to blame for a particular thing that happens in the house. You know, when you see this, thing here you know this the person that puts it there's only one person that will do it and so you find one day you come and you find ah, this is there maybe that particular day it wasn't that one that did it it could be the one that is the the most complex the one that says yes to everything and immediately you see it i know who did this and you mention the name of the person that did it then they tell you why is it that it's only, it's only me why is it that well on today and this, on this occasion that one did it what are you going to say then you say nothing. You know, you don't even go to that person and say, why did you do this? The moment they tell you, no, oh, today it's not me, that person did it. As parents sometimes, we just, okay, oh, okay, she never does it, or she rarely does it. So you don't scold them for doing that. So that is just a whole, it creates a whole drama in the, in the house, which is, which is unhealthy. And I think that uh, sibling rivalry can start at a very early age, you know, when a new baby arrives. <laughs> you know, you, you hear stories of how uh, a toddler will, will, if the mother is not there, lift the baby from, <laughs> if it's lying on a chair and put the baby on the floor or move the baby from the map, you know, try to pull the baby from the mother's lap because, you know, the, somebody else is in the house. and all of a sudden they see that, oh my goodness, all the attention is going on to, so even from a very early age, mm -hmm. that thing of attention, um, and, and you know what, you, sometimes you have these teenagers and you think 
they have grown up and that is something that I'm always conscious of. Um, they can be very tall uh, and if you're not careful you might think, oh she's grown up. Yet inside mm -hmm. they're still very young and uh, we need to, to remember that and treat them according to you know, where mm -hmm. they're at in, 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 their, in their growth. Thank you, um, Pastor Ken, Pastor C. Okay, now that we know what sibling rivalry is, okay, we know it's real, and we've got a, a biblical example. Um, what the Bible didn't tell us is exactly what Joseph did to have merited the position <laughs> of favor, favor, we don't know, out of the 12. So I want to start with you first, uh, Pastor Kinsley, that you know, in terms of the um, you know, parents preferring one child to another because maybe that one is goody two shoes and they're always in my house they used to say graphic reporter always <laughs> reporting on their brothers and sisters mm. you know what should parents do because realistically whether we like it or not as human beings yeah. if you have more than one child there's bound to be one that you know this is just the, the child after my heart so how do you balance yeah uh, parents remaining fair uh, it's a must to their children because uh, we must always realize that these are the gifts that God has given to you. And the truth about children uh, as they are growing up is that we have no clue how they will turn out to become. And God in his wisdom most of the times is so wise at, at times the children that the child that is neglected and overlooked most often they are the ones who turn out to become the champions amongst uh, uh, their, their, their siblings. And one major thing parents should understand and do well to avoid um, when this crops up is a blame game. Uh, it is so strong amongst siblings to the extent that it is always his or her fault. Um, they are fighting because of what he did. They are fighting because of what she did. And if he had not said that, I wouldn't have done that. Oh, he did it, she did it, he did it, she did it. And it is good that we parents understand that, as Pastor C. rightly said uh, uh, a few minutes ago, how at that tender age, they try to lift their, <laughs> the, the new baby. baby because why they think, had it not been for this baby, I would have received that attention. So that blame game started in the Garden of Eden. And when God asked Adam, Adam, where are you? And he hid himself. And when God asked him, have you eaten of the tree? I asked you of the forbidden uh, fruit. Adam was very, uh, he did not even have to think. The first words that came out of his mouth is the woman that you gave me. So in other words, what Adam was saying to God was that, all this time I've been alone with you in this garden, I've never sinned. Have you not brought that woman into my life? There is no way I would have done that. I'm blameless. I'm blameless. And unfortunately, that has become the norm. And it seems it has been passed on to us. So we should let our children understand that uh, they, they have to become responsible. And when Adam and Eve did that, they paid a consequence. And the consequence of that was them being driven out of the garden. And uh, if our children fail, if we as parents fail to help them to understand the need that they are responsible for their actions and the decisions they make, and that each, whatever they do, has a consequence, we will not be helping them. because. The blame game at the end of the, the day makes you a victim. You become a victim in the sense that had he not done that, had she not said that, I wouldn't have done that. And if you look uh, into our, our society today, you, you, you find out that uh, uh, people want to sue people, uh, people strongly believe that they are at the bottom of the ladder because of what Big Brother society is doing, and, and they fail to take that responsibilities for themselves. And if we don't teach them at home, at the end of the day, it has consequences, and they are the ones who will suffer. 
it will create enemies for them because if you keep on blaming people and they also believe that what you are saying is not the truth or what you are doing is that you are only creating enemies uh, for yourself. Okay. Thank you uh, very much, Pastor Kay. Um, Pastor C, I want us to look at, um, so far we've been looking at, you know, parents preferring one child to another. Okay. The child who deliberately, I mean, they know what they're doing, deliberately tries to, you know, put themselves into the favorite position. And you, a parent, observing that, mm, that one is really, how would you, a parent, react to that child? I think um, um, when a child is doing the right thing, um, you, you affirm them. But if you feel that um, they are trying to get first place in, in your heart, you need, to find, you need to get them to understand that you love every one of, you, of your siblings equally, um, that everyone has an equal place in your heart. And I think you may have to say that deliberately and, you know, open up and talk about it, that, you know, I have four children, I have six children, but every one of you is unique in their own way. You need to affirm that and say, um, verbalize it. Every one of you is unique in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a special way. You are like this, this one is like that, that one is like that. And the beauty that it brings to the home, it's great that we are not all looking the same way. It's great that we have different giftings and different abilities, but that's what makes the family, uh, the colors of the family beautiful because everyone brings something into the house. I think you just need to affirm that and you need to uh, encourage them to know that um, you have every one of them at heart. And sometimes they might tell you, hmm, <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> yeah, but you just have to keep affirming it, keep saying it that, you know what, you are all equal in, in, in the sight of God and in the same way you are all equal uh, here as in the, in the family. Yeah, and Julia, to add to that, I, I also think that uh, you need to find a very uh, wise way of rebuking that child. Uh, because the home is also the place where values are transmitted. And if you don't do that, they will go out and, and practice the same because charity always begins at home. And you have to let them know that, uh, uh, as Pastor Steve rightly said, uh, not only do you hold equal love for all of them, but let them know, look, that is your sister, that's your brother. And you don't say that about your brother. You don't say that about your sister. God doesn't like that. It's, it's wrong. And you have to do it. You must be very firm on that, but also very gentle. Mm -hmm. Else, mm -hmm. if you don't do that and you keep on, uh, the more you, you keep on doing that, or what you are enhancing them to do is to make them believe that the best way out of life is to put somebody down. And, and they will take it out and do that, and the disgrace comes to you as a parent. Rebuke them, but gently. Rebuke them gently. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pastor, I'm, I'm going to put the two of you on the spot here, because um, you have you know, four daughters of varying ages. One is married, and then you have a, a younger one who's just finished GCSE. So in a typical scenario, which I suspect has probably happened in your house before, you come home as a daddy, and you know Ruth and Esther in the, the middle ones are going at it and they're having a big argument because this one has done this and that one and this one is blaming that one and this one is saying I'm the older one shut up and listen to me and all the rest of it you as a parent in the middle of that how would you deal with it yeah the, the best uh, how we've handled this in the past is always to call the two of them and at times uh, it's not easy so um, when the tension is just too high, uh, you call one of them into your bedroom and uh, you say, Ruth, you are the eldest, you can't continue. That is when the blame game starts. And look, I, I tell you, the more you do this, you are making yourself a victim because you are saying that you react because of somebody's actions. And how long can you live your life that way? And besides, as the eldest, you have to give leadership. And one of the best ways of giving leadership is to become tolerant and know that she's young, she's growing up.
and she's looking up to you. So uh, you should let her know that this is and they will talk and talk and talk. But first, the best way of doing that is always to calm them down. And at times, engage them in order, because the other one is in the room shouting and, and yelling and, uh, and they talk, but they never fight physically. But so yeah, I, I think it's always wise to talk to the elders first. Then after that, you call the youngest and, and let uh, him or her understand. And for that, in my case, Esther, let Esther know that, look, Esther, she's your big sister. Oh, the blame game starts all over again. <laughs> and that the, uh, 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 because the big ones always believe that the other ones always in the wrong because you are trying to advise them to become responsible. The young one, and she's always picking uh, on me in, in this house and nothing is being done and she keeps on doing it and nothing is being done and she keeps on saying that and nothing is being done. What has helped us over the years is to help them not only to understand that the blame game is dangerous and that uh, it is not a wise way of living, but that they are actions and uh, they will be responsible for whatever actions they take. And one of the best ways that they can handle this is to understand that the same blood, one family, they are together in this, they must always find, and, and it works at times, but at times before you become aware, <laughs> the whole fire ignites again. And it's my, 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 my advice to mm. parents would be to uh, let both children know you love them. Mm. And always, always, always intervene. And the best way of doing that, take one of them into your own room. And as long as you have the time, engage them in a chat till the tempest cool down. So never leave them to go at it before they actually come. In the middle of it, call one and then talk to them. Okay, thank you, uh, Pastor Kay. Pastor C, I'm very happy to hear that it never results in violence, you know. But I know the families watching out, uh, us at the moment, who in their house, it, it does result in violence. You know, one fighting the other, hitting, kicking and that how, how do we deal with that? How do we get the message across to children that you know, violence and all the rest is not right? I think um, it, it's important for parents to set rules in the house um, to say that whatever you do, I know certain families who don't get involved, you can fight, you can yes. quarrel, but you get involved when there's violence. And so it's important for, for families to set rules and say, you know, no violence in this house. I don't have, we don't have boys, so we don't know how it's like when boys are fighting. I'm <laughs> friendly, some girls fight as well. But you know what? Um, I think you should, you should set some ground rules. There should be no fighting, no violence whatsoever in this house there should be no insulting you know don't use insulting and demeaning words in this house and so anytime there's that you know anytime that happens you need to intervene as pastor says um you need to discipline them um, i think we may have to talk about discipline at some point but you will have to discipline them in in, in some way um ground them whatever they like doing ground them uh, in some houses they write lines <laughs> <laughs> or they, they face the wall. <laughs> they face the wall, whatever. Give them discipline. I think um, violence should never be tolerated in the home. One shouldn't feel that the mercy of the other and always being, you know, receiving punches from the other should never be allowed to happen in the house. And so you need to enforce the rules and you need to, you need to set the rules and you need to enforce the rules. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pastor Kinsley. On that note, um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for for today. So thank you both uh, for being with us uh, for this uh, very important discussion. And thank you, our viewers, uh, for staying with us and uh, joining us for uh, this interesting discussion on sibling rivalry. Next time when we come, we'll be looking at the big D word. We'll be looking at discipline. Um, Pastor C has said, set rules. A lot of the rules that you set find uh, their expression in the way you discipline your children. So next time when we come, that is what we'll be discussing. So stay tuned and see you next time.